That's what we're doing. And some of you might be thinking, well, that's a little low, maybe. Or maybe it's a little high. Hey, if we put it in perspective, the 1980s is when personal computers started. Back in the 1980s, I was an elementary school teacher loving it and a company called Big Bear. Do you remember that school, Big Bear, that, that grocery store? Is there one in this area? Big Bear. And they said, if you save enough coupons, you get an Apple computer for your classroom. And we saved all these coupons and had this drive for Grandview City Schools, where I used to work back there, and we had two computers in the 80s, and we were proud of them. We couldn't do much with them, but we were proud that we collected that. The 90s was the time that we started talking about the internet, except it was a different kind of internet. It was one-way communication. It's, I post something out here, you all go look at it, come back and post something else, and then I'll post. There was not two-way digital communication. That happened in about the 2000s with gaming and two-way digital communication where we could start to communicate synchronously in real time with the other person. That was a huge game changer for people. And the first iPhone was 2010, and yes, I told your, I asked your students this, we talked about the rising rates of anxiety and depression that were being diagnosed in school children, right? diagnosed in young adults, and in campus where I work, there's a lot of anxiety and depression going around, and those numbers are rapidly increasing. That trend has happened for about 10 years. And I ask your kids, what happened 10 years ago that this trend would start going upwards? And they said, iPhone was released iPhone was revealed. That came from your kids. I didn't have to make that connection with them. Social media really didn't gain traction till about five years after Web 2.0. Facebook came into play. It was interesting how that all happened with, on that campus and how they did that. Gmail, that is now considered old school, didn't even start with any relevance until 2006. Um, Instagram. 2010, which is a huge influencer for us now, 2012 Snapchat and YouTube, which we'll talk about in a minute. What's the draw of this? In my field, we call this variable reinforcement schedule. That's the draw of social media. Every time they go to a social media site, they may not get a heart. They may not get a like or get a follow. That's tremendously addictive because they'll post something else to go back and try to get that. That is hugely addictive and that is engineered into social media to get us to keep responding in that way to social media. So, cell phones are designed a little bit like slot machines because every time I put something in a slot machine, I may not get what I want out of it. So I'll go back and check again just to make sure. That hits a part of the brain called the striatum that is the habit-loving part of our brain. What's the good thing about the striatum? Habits allow us to do things without thinking. What's the bad thing about the striatum? It doesn't care whether it's a good habit or a bad habit. It just wants the habit that it just did. So if we can get our kids posting positive in positive ways, that's going to be a habit that that part of their brain will love. That's my take on it. Listen, I get it. Youth t need technology to learn. For them to be successful in their careers, they're going to have to navigate technology appropriately. They really are. I get it, I get it, I get it. I get this statistic too. They're more than likely to be learning from a screen than they are from standard text. I get it. That's where I work. I haven't been in that city live for 15 years. But I work there. I pay New York City taxes. How about, can you believe that? They make me pay New York City. Oh, I forgot. I'm sorry, NYU. I know, you're making me pay New York City tax. But I don't live there. My students are live on my screen. I'm live on their screen. I instruct in real time through them. I get that. I get the power of digital media. But a question I ask myself every time, every time I'm thinking about my practices, can I balance? the good things from social media and stay out of the bad things.
Can I stay on that digital log so I can get where I'm walking and proceed in an appropriate way to be able to move forward? And do I have control over my social media or am I being enticed to use it more often? Some of you may remember this right here, if I can get it to click back. Some of you may remember this thing right here. Remember that thing? Now, I didn't do this today, but a lot of times when I present, I say, anybody know what that thing is? And they're like, yeah, that's a phone. And I said, do you know how you called somebody on that phone? And I guess I go, there were seven digits, and you put your finger in the dial, and you go like this, and then you wait till it comes around. Then you put the next one, and you have to put them in the right order. And then you put the next one, and then when it's there, and it rings on the other end, they pick it up and answer it. And you know what kids typically say to me? They typically say, but you would have to know that number. And I said, yes, you would have to know the number, but they had a thing called a phone, they had a thing called a phone book. And everything was written in there, and it was alphabetical, and the numbers were in there, and before you called, you could look that up. And I'll never forget, a couple years, this little girl was sitting there, this little middle school girl, she looked at me, she goes, that's kind of cool. And I'm like, okay, why am I bringing this up? That's a tremendously secure device. That's much more secure than my cell phone. Much more secure. There are no engineers working behind the scenes to get me to use that more often. There are no engineers monetizing my phone conversations and selling my metadata from my transactions on that phone to other buyers out there in the regions who are doing it. They just don't do it. Can I balance a brain that's pre-wired for fun with a brain that's pre-wired to minimize risk and can I think appropriately? Hey listen, the students I talked to today, I did not share this with them, but there's a very obvious thing and that's simply this. Your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain, is not fully developed until age what? About what age? Yeah, it's after age 25. So any of those kids I was talking to today, their amygdala and limbic system was firing full force. Their emotional part of their brain was good to go. And their top part of their brain is kind of half-baked. So people who work with kids kind of understand that, that we're helping them think with half-baked brains because they'll be able to logically problem solve better at age 27 than they do at 17 and better at 17 than they do at 7. That's a tremendous challenge, is can we get them to hit pause and be excited about the learning and the networking that they can engage in on social media? And can they balance that out with, ooh, but I'm not firing on all cylinders here, and if I make a mistake, one of the things, well, I'll share that in a minute. But that's kind of a message. I asked the senior class as they were leaving, they're very professional with and I said, I'm going to be talking to your middle schoolers this afternoon. What one kind of message would you like to send me? Now, this is out of the mouth of a 17 or 18-year-old. I don't know how old that kid was. And he said to me, he goes, seriously, ask them to use good judgment now so that they can do what they want to do when they're my age. That came from one of your students, so that's what I told them. They get it. They heard it. Can I balance it? Can I do what I want to do and get where I want to go? Yeah, because there's rings of responsibility that are out there. I've done some work with diversion programs, so kids get themselves in trouble on social media, and so if they complete this diversion program and they're able to you know, have that record sealed or whatever they do with diversion programs. So they go through a program that I've facilitated. And one of the things that I noticed when I came in there is their parents had to come too, or their guardian had to come too. And so how I started with them is say, what you did impacts the other people who were in the room who didn't post what you posted. Tell me why that happened. And that happened because of rings of responsibility. When I post, when I say something, there aren't great rings of responsibility. You can uh, forget what I say, it could not go, forget the other than the streaming, it could not go beyond this room unless I wanted it to. But when I put it out there in the digital world, who knows where it's ending up? 
One of the things you know quite well is if a student misuses social media in this district what, and it rises to the level of law enforcement and gets out there, that one of the first adjectives in front of sp school, in front of students, in front of district is going to be Princeton. Princeton blah, blah, blah player. Princeton, you know, student. Princeton whatever. So when they post, they not only post for themselves, they post for their family, and they post for their school, and they post for their future. And that with those rings of responsibility, if we can help them think that through, and that's every kid, everywhere, that when you post something, you're posting something more than that. When I work for a company and consult for a company and talk with them, it's very clear that they are very serious about their employees, what their employees post on social media about the company that employs them. They're very serious about that. And I asked the students today, I said, every school district I know has somebody's job is to post the positive things that are happening in the school district. Every company I've been to has somebody whose job it is to promote the positive aspects of that company and put it out there online. Do you care enough about your reputation that you can employ yourself and post positive? So are you worth less than the school district? Are you worth less than um, the company? No. So why wouldn't I do for myself what large organizations know? And you darn better, well, learn how to do that. And that was part of my message to them today. What is the reach of social media? Just take a minute and look at that. We can inadvertently be lulled into the idea that I post into the ether and it evaporates. That's simply not the case. Simply not the case. The internet is public, not private. And I, when I shared with your students that, I go, y'all have known that because they teach you that in technology citizenship, digital citizenship, all the courses of study as you're going. I know your teachers have told you this. They're like, yeah, yeah, we know. Okay, well, let me show you what this means. I live 10 miles from Ohio State University, and I sent a message from me to one of my buddies at Ohio State University, 10 miles away. And I watched on Traceroute, which is just a website that I can get that really is intended to watch where um, my website pings and make sure it's working appropriately. And I sent it, and I'm like, I wonder where my message goes. That is where my message, that's what it took for my message to go 10 miles. And it goes a different path every time. The rule of the internet is not go the most secure way. The rule is to go the fastest way. So it'll go another way. And that's a good thing so that we can keep using the internet appropriately for what we're trying to do. But man, that's a long way to go. And I said, well, I wonder what happened when we go here, and so there's, if I page down under that, I just took a screen grab of, off of it because it's pages and pages and pages. Those are IP addresses and router numbers of all the places it went. That one simple message went right there. And beside it, those are how many milliseconds it takes to go that direction. See, we inadvertently think, incorrectly think, that because something is fast, it's safe and secure. So I shared with your kids, when you leave school today and you look out and you see that street that's out there, and you see a car going 80 miles an hour, do you say to yourself, man, that's a safe and secure vehicle. But if we look at this and we see that moving in milliseconds across the country, we think, oh, it's safe and secure. Right? Ooh, ooh, that's what I mean when I say that. Here's one reason, a simple reason why the internet is public and not private. It's because it's sort of cobbled together. And I don't know how I had this notion that if one of you are messaging me and you, we go from device to device right there, I kind of naively thought that it just kind of magically teleported from here to here. And that's all the further it goes. That was how it works. It goes across because we're going through fiber optics and cables that are buried and cables that are under the ocean and cables that are above it. 
and cell phone towers. And it's all kind of cobbled together. So there are a lot of points of entry. So what I'm putting out there to them is, hey, guess what? It's public, not private. Let's take advantage of that in a good way, and let's post positive. If what you post never goes away, data's data. Then why not leverage that and post positive things, like schools and companies have learned how to do? Why not do that for yourself? And that was my message to them today. Now, for this group here, let's see what's happening over the last couple of years with screen time. Because screen time isn't just social media, it's consumption of all media. So let's see what's going on. And the research I'm citing now is from a place that's pretty good, common sense media. That's a kind of a good place for you to go to to get some data that has something behind it with some backbone so you're able to make sense of it. Look at this. The amount of screen use we're not talking about school or homework. For the top one is tweens, the bottom ones is teens. That's how much media is being consumed. Digital media is being consumed. That's a game changer. And that trend is rising. Okay, smartphone ownership. So that's one of the common questions that parents will ask. Well, what do you think? At what, what age? What, when should a kid have a device? Well. Depends on your kid, depends on a lot of factors. I certainly don't know. But what I can show you is the data and what those around them are doing. And the top line, if we look at that, is 2019. The bottom line is 2015. On the left is how old the kid is. And on the right is, is starting at age eight up through teenage years. I would say that's a trend, and that trend is continuing. That's an upward trend that is continuing to move up. So it becomes pretty obvious to me that that's ubiquitous. It's pretty obvious to me that they're walking around with devices that they have ready access to that have powerful computing tools. That's pretty obvious to me. And they're using those to consume media. Some of them. I'm heartened by this, are using it to create media. Good for them. I hope your kid's one of them. But some of them are simply consuming it and are being monetized in doing that. They become somebody else's monetization. Okay, let's ask this one. So here's the time spent watching only videos. This is what this research, now I'm, uh, only videos, an hour a day. Well, if they're only awake, I don't know what your teenagers were like, but mine, man, they slept a lot. If they're only awake, maybe, I don't know, 13 hours a day, that's a big chunk of their time. They're doing nothing but watching videos. So when you see this, that's what they're doing. Do you ever want to say, look up? When they're <laughs> and so I was walking around Ohio State campus. I was doing some work there a year ago. And I took a screen grab. I wish I had it here to show you. They have written signs that go down. by, the, And I go, I wonder why the stop sign is down there. I wonder why the message is right there before you cry. Why is that? That's why. Because they're like, Tim, look at the kids walking around here. I'm like, oh. So it goes into their. So we as a society are adapting to that. Favorite online media space? Pretty clear, pretty clear on this one. On the left is YouTube, on the right is everybody else. And so generally, when adolescents, generally boys, are consuming media, it's on YouTube. And they're watching videos of not always educationally sound things. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I wish they would create more stuff. And there's also a gender difference. So to be able to guide our kids as faculty, staff, parents, guardians, grandparents, we have to know what is it that we're looking at so that we can get a step ahead of them. Green is for girl, okay? So how you read that? Music, the trend is girls tend to be consuming more music than boys, okay? Online videos, 
the opposite trend is true. Boys tend to be consuming that more. So there's a difference in some expectations, I would set by gender. Social media in, gen in general, interacting on Snapchat or Instagram or whatever their, their choice is, um, it's generally more consumed by girls. And that's generally the trend in my world that I see going around. That's generally the trend I see. Okay? Now, here's a biggie. Remember, green is for girls. Video games. Look at the difference in consumption between boys and girls. So if I'm raising a boy, I'm learning two things. I'm paying attention to video sites like YouTube, and I'm paying attention to their gaming. Because with gaming, one of the things that we have to watch for is that our kids are not as good at screening out um, bad guys from good guys in the gaming world. They think they know who they're gaming with. They don't know. They've never met most of these people face to face. And I hope they don't. But that's kind of space that we look at to help them with that. Okay? Twice as likely to use a computer. Yes. All right, some apps to be aware of. Let me be pragmatic and only talk about those things that they're consuming a lot of. Instagram, consuming a lot of that. It's being used as posts for all kinds of things. And what we need to know about that is that it's visualized, it creates images of kids that they compare themselves to. It's social referencing. That's the draw on Instagram. That's the draw for us. Look at that vacation they're on now. I'm not on that vacation. It's that comparison. It's that comp Now, they don't post all the, you know, missed luggage and missed flights and bad connections and mosquito bites and everything else on that dream vacation. But when our kids look at what's being posted on Instagram, they think, people are living a better life than me. It's simply not the case. It just looks better on Instagram. YouTube, I would pay attention to that and learn a little bit about that. And just take a minute and look at what's actually on there. This is a self-policing site for the most part. And people will ask me, is it okay for my kid to put their Lego stuff on you know, uh, YouTube? Or is it okay for my kid? And my response is, it depends upon your kid. But the thing I'm thinking is that, yes, if they disable comments, well, why does a kid want to put their stuff on social media to get positive comments? It doesn't enter their brains that people are going to tear them up in the online world. It doesn't even come into their awareness until it happens. So, yeah, if they want to disable comments, have at it. Put yourself on social media. Snapchat, boy, this used to be a big one when I started doing this seven or eight years ago. This was popular because kids inappropriately thought that when I hit delete, I set that little dial on there and my snap goes away. Nobody's going to see that. Ooh, bad assumption. When they shifted a couple years ago and went to, you're able to locate your friends on social media, one of the first things that the SRO came up to me as I was presenting and said, have you seen this? And it was Kings Island, whatever. It was the uh, presentation of gathering of the Ohio school, whatever they were, school resource officers or something. He goes, I just want to show you this. Showed me, he goes, this is Snapchat now, and if they allow location services, you can find all these kids on Snapchat. I'm like, what? Now you can go ghost mode, and you're invisible, but really you want your friends to find you. Like, well, I wonder if kids know that. So then they learned that. So everything that social media gives us is a positive, we have to be careful about to make sure that's really what we want our kids doing. This one has exploded. TikTok used to be called Musical.ly, and I would give questions, get questions, is it okay for my kid to do this? And it's, it's a site that lets you uh, video stuff and put it out there online that's typically performance-based, art or music. And it's a lot of fun for kids. A lot of people enjoy it. Uh, with this, the older you are, the safer it is. Um, if kids are younger, they may have trouble filtering out who's okay for us to interact with and who's not. And I encourage you to look at Common Sense Media's guide for what you can um, share with your kids if they're on TikTok so that they can defend themselves, so that they can 
not trust everybody that they see on any site, but particularly the younger they are. These are some things, some kind of red flags that I would pay attention to if you see these kinds of um, apps starting to show up on your kids' phones. Um, these are called camouflage or ghost apps, and it's places where kids can hide things. It's the yellow solo cup of the app world, right? Sure, that's Diet Coke in there. That's what's in that red solo cup. That's fine. And it's the same thing with this. Vault, <laughs> it's very privacy focused. And if your kid has that, who are they hiding it from? They're hiding it from you. And they're hiding it from anybody with authority over them. Why would they need to do that? Particularly if most kids are smart enough to have a passcode embedded in their uh, uh, iPhones or in their cell phones that essentially turns this into a brick if you don't have that code to get in there. Well, they're hiding it from people with power over them. And so if they feel a need to hide somebody, but it literally, it's almost like a doorbell camera for your house where it'll, <laughs> if somebody's trying to get into that app to see what's inside that app, um, it will record the person who's trying to get in the app. It'll also, um, yeah, anyways. So yeah, it, it's good privacy. And if our kids, are, why do they need that if I'm on a phone? So I, iPhones are essentially encrypted out of the box. But why do I need that? Well, it's trying to hide stuff from somebody. Kick, in the days of we had to pay for messaging, that used to be powerful because that was a free way for kids to message. If your kid has Kick, why are they using it when they're not using other chat features? That's a conversation I would think about having with them. Partly because of their involvement with some pretty significant crimes that have been in the area. Omegle, same thing. Same thing. Why are they on an app that says this at the bottom? This is from their website. Do I want my kid on? Well, wait a minute. And I'm not going to go into what that's about, but that's just a random video pairing. It's two groups of people who are randomly paired together videoing each other when they come on. Just random. Okay. All right. Private photo vault. Yeah. That's another security vault where things, files that they don't want other people to see are hidden. So that's a discussion point. If that's on my kid's phone, tell me why that's on, that, on your phone and tell me why that's working. Tell me how to work this phone. Tell me how to use this app. And why are you using that app? The discussion point. Hot or not, well, you talk about a recipe for online cruelty. You, it's a rating app where you rate other people. And if you both rate each other the same way, you now get to talk to each other. Wants to, but that, okay. Whisper is a confessional app. It's meant to do this. Tell your secrets online and you'll feel better. Well, I can tell you as a counselor that if I'm <laughs> telling my secrets online, I'm not going to feel better. So I don't know about that advice out of the box. But here's how it's being used. It's not that I tell my secrets online. It's that he tells my secrets online, how it's being used. And if I'm looking at that, and that's on my kid's phone, it's like, you know, let's have a talk about that, why that's on there. Best secret folder, again, it's another app that looks like one thing. It looks like a media folder, but it kind of looks a little funny because there's a key that goes in there, so I have to have a password in it. And if I open it up, it works like other security apps. It will record me. It can. If I come in here, woo, you know, there's my dad trying to look at my phone. Look at this app. Okay, how about this one? Fake calculator. I'm trying to think of a good reason of what a student would tell me that they have the fake calculator app. Fake calculator works as a calculator. But until I put the passcode in, let's pretend it's 3.14 to sound like I'm mathematical. I don't even know what 3.14 is. That to you guys? But if I put that code in there, it opens up 
the vault of that app. So again, but again, I think being able to have conversation with our students, with our kids, about, let's talk about your phone, here's some of my expectations, and will you show me how some of these apps work? Adjoining with them and allowing the person who knows more, the student, to teach you about the app is a way to do it. What's app? Great app if you're going overseas, let you communicate. Communicated with my mom when she was in Europe through WhatsApp, okay? Because I don't want those charges roaming on me or through other apps to do that. But we have to watch that if kids are using that here because it can be a little pushy in trying to connect kids in contact list. I'm saying it's unsafe, I'm just saying be aware that it, it's pushy and that um, it can try to add kids to apps without the kids really kind of knowing what's going on. Tinder, <laughs> it's the... It's the old, old dating app. You swipe one way for if you like something, a person. You swipe another way if you like that person, right? And the goal is to get swipes the positive way. So I was doing a presentation at a high school um, probably five years ago on the southwest side of Columbus, and there was a commotion in the front row. I'm like, what is going on there? So my buddy I was presenting with was a law enforcement guy. He's like, ah. So afterwards, I heard him talking to those kids who were kind of scuffling around. He goes, oh, man. He goes, one kid grabbed another kid's phone and on Tinder, as a joke, swiped right to allow that person to communicate with her friend. Well, that person was quite a bit older, and that person now knew where this student was located. So that's now um, kind of a problem for a minor. So Tinder, mm, I don't know. Lipsy, mm, that's a rating app. I don't know how many of you have had this happen to you, but sometimes there's a thing called um, 360 feedback within organizations. And so some of the time mm, I spent executive coaching, it's helping with those kind of evaluations that people have received. And it's anonymous evaluations from all kinds of people, and it stings. It stings to get that feedback like that when you're not sure who that's coming from. And this is tacked onto social media accounts, attached to them, so that people can give you feedback about your images that are on there without you knowing who's doing it. Okay. Hala is another one that's kind of live, random video chat. You know, you just you and the stranger you're paired up with suddenly appear on the camera. That's a red flag for me. That's, why is my kid on that? And what are they doing on that? All right, the scariest thing in the digital world to me, here's probably the scariest thing in the What I create never goes away. Data is data. It's still there somewhere, somehow. And so am I careful about what I'm posting? If, data, if it, what I post never goes away and it's a positive post, what a beautiful thing. But if it's a negative post or it's a post that's going to swirl around me in unintended ways five years from now, that's not such a beautiful thing. And so we talked about that today because it's, whoops, it's permanent. Delete does not mean gone for And the kids are like, I know, I know, I know. But if I say to them, we'll do a little experiment Copy a file, copy kind of a large file, duplicate it, copy it onto your device, see how long it takes. And then see how long it takes you to delete that file. If copying and deleting are doing the same thing, adding to and take from, it should take about the same amount of time. It doesn't. And that's because that uh, document is not being deleted, it's being moved. It's still accessible to anybody who knows how to find it. But that is what happens with social media, is that when they create something and they delete it, it does not mean gone for good. That's part of my passion for helping kids post in positive ways. That's a beautiful thing. If you're posting out of grit and gratitude, examples of that in your personal life, what a wonderful thing if it doesn't go away. What not a great thing if it's something that you're like, you know, Maybe back a couple years ago, I shouldn't have posted that. 
because my feelings about this have changed. Okay? All right. We can control what we knowingly produce. We have no control over somebody um, using our metadata and commoditizing it, selling it. I don't know. Take an example. Say you go online and you happen to be talking about shoes or looking at a shoe. And then you close down that browser and you open up the next day. What kind of ad pops up the next day? How did they find that out? Well, it's your metadata. They found out on the outside of what you were doing, where you went and how you got there. Screenshots. Oh my gosh, somebody can take a screenshot. I can let somebody inside my social media and look around and do whatever they want and screen, screen shoot it and do whatever they want with it. To me, it's like a digital hurricane. I'm kind of fascinated with the ocean, and so I love it. But it's a little bit like a hurricane. Hurricanes, you have to have the conditions just right for a hurricane. The right temperature, the right water, the right time of year. Tide has to be right for a hurricane. And when it happens, look out. But our kids kind of think, well, I posted that. Nothing bad happened to me. Right? Hurricane didn't, the conditions weren't right. The thing I can't do for our students and that we can't do for our students is predict in their life when that digital hurricane is going to happen. Because if they post, nothing bad happened to me. Post again, nothing bad happened to me. Well, when is that hurricane, when are those conditions going to be just right for them? Okay. How can they do that? Because they post and post and post. And essentially, they think that nobody pays attention to my post, which simply is not the case. Okay. My stance is this. We worry a lot about bad guys and predators and privacy, and I think we should. But the biggest threat to our students is what they choose to post themselves. The biggest threat to our student are those kids they allow inside their privacy settings who will take umbrage at something that they've done. In their world, it might be I try out for this club or activity and I make it, and this other person got cut. They didn't make the cut or didn't get the award, and that other person is now jealous of me. Sometimes kids call them haters. Right? Well, what's to stop that person from watching social media, and then as soon as that kid who made the team or sport or club or whatever it is that they made, and good for them, post something inappropriate on social media, and bang, that screenshot and sent to the principal, or the screenshot and sent to the coach. So in the kids' world, I think it's really important for them to think that through, that not everybody has their best interest in mind, and if they are achieving at a high level, great, post about it, whatever, but be mindful that if your posts kind of trend towards negative or you post something sketchy, somebody may use that to cut you down to size, to be able to have you dismissed from a team or a sport or an activity or a position of leadership in the school. And that, that's some of the gainsmanship that I hope that they can avoid. I take something called the 77 South High Street test before I post. And that's simply this, 77 South High Street test is where my counseling license is housed at the Counselor and Social Worker Board. And part of the code of ethics is that I maintain my professionalism on social media in the same way that I would in my office. Okay? That's just the expectation, ethically. So if I'm about to post something and I think, should I post this or shouldn't I post this? I imagine myself reading that post at 77 South High Street. And if part of me doesn't want to read it there, I'm not going to post it. For the kids, I teach them something called the grandma test. I shared that with some of your middle schoolers today. And the grandma test is simply this. If you have a question about whether you should post something or not, think of, would I show this to my grandma? And if you wouldn't show it to your grandma, don't post it. And that's worked for me for three or four years, but there was an elementary school, one of my former students became a counselor, and she's like, will you come talk to our elementary school? I'm like, yeah. And so I didn't, wasn't prepared for the pre-K kids. Pre-K, I mean, I looked down, I didn't see a body, I just saw tops of heads. And so I looked at them, and I'm like, what am I going to talk to pre-K kids? So we talked about icons, and they said, do you know what this is? 
Snapchat. You know what this is? Instagram. Do you know nice words you could say online? Mm-hmm. And so they talked about nice words, and then this, of course, the kid raises his hand. I know some bad words to say online, right? And so I was like, no, 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 no we're not going to talk about that. But I said, you know, here's something that you can do is that if you want to post something online and you're not sure, use the grandma test and think would I, use, would I um, show it to my grandma. And this little guy, I'll never forget him sitting in the front row, kind of looked at me and just went, you don't know my grandma. And that stopped me. And so I said, well, do you have an uncle? Yeah. Well, show it to your uncle and see if, <laughs> okay. All right, so if there's somebody else whose prefrontal cortex, whose thinking part of their brain is fully developed that they can check something off of, I think that's something worth talking about. Now, I do trainings with um, high school and middle school kids to present with me at elementary schools with the middle school kids and at middle school with the high school kids. And boy, do they listen to their kids talking about their own safe and smart digital practices. But what I learned during the course of the training from the teens who are in this program is a couple things. What's the big draw about social media with so much on? It's staying in touch. You know the most popular social media app? It's the one their friends are on. It doesn't matter what the trending one is. It's what their friends are on. So we're really, and it's not unusual if I'm training 12 kids for there to be five different platforms that kids tell me is their favorite platform to be on with their friends. So that taught me something, right? That taught me also that they're tired of the drama on social media. But if I pull away from it, I'm disconnected from my friends. So I wish there was less drama, and I wish we could stay connected. Seems to be a common thing, all right? Many teens monitor their own screen time. I, today, I was amazed. I said, all right, how many of you get screen time reports if you have an iPhone? And I expected, oh, the old man's got something on you guys, right? Not half the kids would raise their hand. I'm like, good for you, that's good wellness. Do you watch how much screen time you're using? They went like this. Ooh, ooh, so that, that's a positive, all right? And they want to have conversations about social media. They really do but they don't want to talk about the same old thing. They want to talk about how that's impacting them, not us. And so if we can craft some of these kind of conversations in this way, that line is up there is because I used it extensively, and I ask kids to think about it this way. If this is my line I'm drawing for social media, and over there is inappropriate, and over here is appropriate, how close to the line am I coming with some of my social media posts? I said, how about profanity? One of the kids actually went like this. I said, I noticed you went back a ways from that. And she said, yeah, I want to make sure that I don't unintentionally put profanity on social media. Now, how about this? How about making fun of friends? Same kid. Came right up and said, you know, I'm pretty close to the line on I'll watch that. So if we can have conversations with our kids about what's behind the line, what's over the line, there's a clear one in every one of the presentations there was, you guys have wonderful SROs and law enforcement, by the way, law enforcement present during this, and they know that quite well, that their line they're most concerned about is that they're not crossing that legal line. And I do that at every presentation I go to. Talk with kids about where is your line? Who draws that line? Us. Am I drawing the line for you? No. Because intellectually, that's fair and that's true. I have something that I advocate called a tech talk with students. And there's some components of a tech talk that I think are essential, and it's an ongoing conversation with our students about media. I also train um, counselors to talk with their clients and have a tech talk with them. Here's how I'll interact with you when you're my client. Here's what I won't do. Here's what I will do. You can't, I don't friend or follow people who are my clients. I train teachers and administrators to do the same thing. Do you have a tech talk with your students? When are you accessible through digital media? Essentially, when you go to a flipped classroom, you're, essential, you're um, available all the time. So we have to set that boundary. 
and know when and how we'll be communicating with people. The boundary we're setting at home is simply this. How many hours of screen time, young man or young woman, do you think is appropriate for you on social media? What's your goal? Put it out there. I think that's a discussable point. I think that's something that, that could have some legs to it. When is your digital curfew? What does that mean? Well, when is it lights out? They, they have a curfew where they're not allowed to be wandering out there in the streets, right? But do we really want them wandering around out there in the digital world at 1 a.m. when they're coming to class here at you know, 7 a.m. or taking a zero period band class here or something? How late do we want them using social media when they have to get I walked in this morning, I was like, whoa, the music was playing, the band was playing. I'm like, dude, it's barely 7 o'clock and you guys are cranking it up. Well, to do that, they have to be resting. So is there a point where we can say, you know what, curfew for your media is this time. And it's not any different. My vice was Hardy Boys mystery books. You guys know what I'm talking about? And so I was supposed to go to bed at a certain time. I didn't. And so I'd be under the sheets reading, blanket with a flashlight, reading Hardy Boys books. Well, I probably should have been asleep, but at least I wasn't communicating with who knows who and having my emotions run wild. I was reading a book. I was consuming print media when I did that. That's different now. Online video time, that got my attention, that there's a, an hour of a student's productivity that is being sent every day on consuming videos. That got my attention. That might be worth a tech talk to have with your kid. Uh, boys in gaming, that might be. You raising boys? It's worth a discussion point to ask them about what their practices are with gaming. And do you know the people you're gaming with? E-gaming is becoming huge. Going to, I'm going to have receive an e-gaming training next Wednesday night at 5 o'clock to learn more about it. But that's becoming majors in schools. It's becoming career choices. There are teams being formed for universities to compete against other kids. So this is something to pay attention to. And am I doing this safely? Am I gaming as safely as I am in the physical world? That's worth a discussion point. There's look for the S. If your kids are transacting anything online, is it a secure website by either an S in the HTTP or the lock on some of the uh, browsers like Chrome so that the kid knows this is a secure site or this isn't? Have we talked with them about that? Might be something to think about. And a lot of kids use their phone as their alarm clock. That's what I did this morning. I used my phone as my alarm clock. And is there something that I set it to blue light? Or am I using blue light? Or am I using green light? Current research about is that impacting us as we're sleeping? And is that something that we talk with our kids about? OK, that's what I mean by the S. Okay, that's what I mean by the lock. So are we teaching our kids, if we're doing financial transactions, probably with your credit cards, um, are they doing it safely? All right. Now, here's why I think it's hard to take a break from social media. It's because that's what they're using to stay connected with each other. If I'm not connected, I, and they'll just flat out, not in an auditorium setting, but in a trading center setting, tell me, this is because I want to know what they're saying about me. I don't want to not know. OK. But that's the mindset of a lot of kids. Whoop. That's the mindset of a lot of kids. So I have some suggestions about that. That as you're going through the tech talk, and what I'm learning from trying to train professionals to do it with their own clients, I'm learning about that how to do that with our kids as well, is what kind of things am I putting out there as the parameter is OK, what kind of thing not? Here's, here's what the middle school and high school principals did today in the face-to-face -face world. As you're entering in, make sure you're coming into here professionally. Make sure you're sitting down, and make sure you're sitting up straight, and make sure that you're focusing. And this is what the speaker's going to talk about, and make sure you're tracking that speaker. See, they were teaching them to use those kind of things in the face-to-face -face world. 
because kids don't intuitively know that. We can also teach kids the appropriate way for them to manage social media because they don't come to it naturally. So can we spend as much time trying to do the, help the kids respond appropriately in social media as we do so well in the face-to-face -face world? Can they check their footprint? Every now and then, look, ask your kid, or for yourself, look at your own last three posts, and this, does this reflect who I am? If I Google myself, what pops up? If your kid Googles themselves, what pops up? If they search for their image online, what pops up? I would want to know that if I'm their age. And what is it that other people can find out about me online? This is an example of a near peer training that I did in another school district. And it's a beautiful thing. The kids on the left are talking about their great digital practices. And what an opportunity for them to learn to talk in front of others. And that's what it looks like. And it's no picnic looking at a bunch of eyes staring back at you. It's different looking this way than it is looking this way. And if we can get our kids involved in programs where they're leading and talking to other kids about positive things, then we've got something going on that we can build upon. Um, one of my things that I shared with your kids is this. Can they do this? So if we want to be able to help them, can they put the I in kind? Can they, on their own, through their social media practices, be kind? I have a K and N and a D in presentations like this I do. And this just happens to be one of my small trainings where the leaders were being trained. And I challenge them, I go, now go stand over there. Are you going to put the I in kind on social media today? I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. Click. Okay. And so K can make a conscious decision to work hard, be kind, post positive, and have success follow. That's a conscious decision they can make. I show them images of pretty high profile professional athletes who know how to post positive. And even though they're big and bad and rough and tough, they know how to post positive. Well, what a thing for a young man to say when he's making all this money and he's a pro athlete and he posts, he talks, I listen. He's talking about a veteran. That's called humility. And what a wonderful trait that is in young people. Listen, they can, we can teach them to share their positive practices online. We can teach them to post positive. We can ask them to look for positive things online and post about it. I showed them lists of activities that are available at both of your high schools and middle schools. I said, get involved and post about the positive things that are coming out of that. You want to make a difference in the world? Walk your talk. Mm. Social media is the microphone for your, for your character. I teach them about this. This guy's name is Rudolph. He was a wide receiver for Florida State University a year or so ago. And Travis Rudolph was his name. And so he came into a school site, just like this one, and he looked around, and they often take their athletes and put them out there. And it looked just like this. Everybody's going, Travis, Travis, come sit by me, you know. All the crammed full tables. And he went and sat by a kid who was sitting by himself. He's like, uh-uh, I'm going to go sit with this kid. Somebody took an image of that, put it on Facebook. You know who saw it? The kid's mother who was eating lunch by himself. He's like, thank you for doing that. Travis goes back to the school site, goes back to the Florida State University. Coach says, uh, come here for a minute. I don't know how you guys are when somebody goes, can you see me? But do you start going through a laundry list of all the things that you did wrong? Okay. And it wasn't what he did wrong, it was what he did right. He goes, I'd like you to invite that kid to the football game this Saturday night, and here's some jerseys and here's some passes for he and his mom. And so he did that. Well, in true Babe Ruth fashion, fashion Travis Rudolph scores a touchdown in the game where that kid was watching. The digital point for that was it was on ESPN. ESPN has a huge social media following. Well, guess what happened? when they showed this along with his outreach to the school. I ask you this, if you're running a company and you see Travis Rudolph out there applying for a job and you Google him and this image pops up, 
on your social media screen, if I can get it to go backwards, this one right here, how hireable do you think that young man is right now? How hireable do you think he is right now? Right? And how about this? How about some of these big, rough, tough athletes we have at Ohio State University? What a beautiful little note this kid wrote to J.K. Dobbins. And J.K. Dobbins could have ignored it, could have done nothing. You know what he said? Love this. Hopefully I can meet you someday. How did, that's, that's a high-profile elite athlete doing that, posting positive like that. If he can do it, can't we do it? How about this? How about this kid? Now, he sets a record. Dwayne Hask, he throws for more yardage in one game than anybody ever did. And he didn't do one of these or do one, whatever. He did only room for improvement. What? Oh, excuse me. Only room for improvement. That's what he did. All right. How about this one? If we're collecting good social media posts. Okay? Dwayne Haskins crossing out the M's in Michigan is kind of a little tradition they have at Ohio State when they play Michigan. They cover up all the M's on campus, you know. But he starts talking about Troy Smith, a former Buckeye athlete who had a great game against Michigan. He's promoting somebody else in his own social media post. That's called posting positive. How about this girl who was born without hands who won a handwriting contest? That's called posting positive when we see examples of that in the world. How about this young man who is an offensive tackle for the University of South, Southern California whose sister was seriously ill and needed a bone marrow transplant and the match was, guess who, him. Well, he's in preseason tr football training. He's going to miss time in football training. What does he say? Hey, man, it's my baby sister. We had the procedure, came back in. I loved watching those games. Just because of him this year. That's called posting positive. My niece, who works at Cincinnati Children's, somewhere around, I don't know where I am now, and she posted this about a positive things that, that some of us can do to post in the digital world to make our kids. I'm like, yay, my niece got it. How about J.K. Dobbins, who was posting this, was said, Brandon Bowen, one of his offenses tackles, said, hey, I'm so glad you won the award. And J.K. said, thank you. Thank you on social media to somebody like that. How about this of Urban Meyer, who congrat the former football coach who congratulated him? And they said, I love you too, man. Okay? So post and positive. We all have 86,400 <laughs> seconds in our lives. And if we can talk with our kids about posting positive, if we can talk with others about posting positive, we can make their career path much more palatable for them. And if we can do that in our own way and keep those kids safe and secure. That's my message for you, is that the digital world's not going away. Can we tame it and learn to post positive by having tech talks with our students and encouraging efforts to use social media's long reach to our advantage rather than being concerned about the reach the other way. Thank you. I'll stick around for a while. If you want to come up and ask me questions individually, I'm glad to answer questions of your one-on-one. -on -one. But thank you for taking the time to learn about how to help your kids put the eye in kind in the digital world. Thank you so much. Be embarrassed.